Pierre, and I have the privilege of serving as Dean of the Boston University School of Public Health. Thank you everybody for joining us for part of our public health conversation series. This is a series of uh, seminars that we, that we put together roughly weekly around leading issues in our time. First, before we introduce today's session, I would like to say thank you to everybody who made this event happen, particularly Dean's office with, uh, with Meredith Brown and Alicia Noel, thank you. And I also want to thank everybody who's part of these conversations. We find that these conversations are really improved by everybody who participates in them. We always look forward to the questions and learn from them. Thank you everybody for joining, particularly during a busy and uncertain time. I'm particularly looking forward to today's conversation. Today we are talking about teaching. Teaching has been at the forefront in all our minds over the past year 2020. For anybody whose job it is in an educational institution, we have never seen upheaval like this year. And in particular, the intersection of teaching with our goals of inclusion and diversity. This is something that we have struggled with historically in the best of times. And let's face it, 2020 have not been the, has not been the best of times. My hope always is that through such upheaval as we're having in the past year, innovation will emerge. My hope is that as we learn how to do things better, as we learn how to weigh risks, as we learn how to weigh benefits, as we collectively work harder, twice as hard than ever to do the work that is core to our mission, teaching of our students, preparing the next generation in difficult times, we learn how to do it better. And today we have an outstanding panel that is going to teach us what we should know about that. And perhaps I see today's panel as a bit of a mid, a half, halfway, halfway review, because I'm sure we'll be convening again a year from now and learning even more by then. And I'm really grateful to all the panelists for joining us. I'm going to turn over today's event to Dr. Laura Magania. Dr. Magania is the CEO and president of the Association of Schools and Programs of Public Health. Before this job, she served as a Dean of School of Public Health in Mexico for many, many years. I have the privilege of working with Laura closely in my role as chair of the board of ASPPH and I learn from her every day. I'm really delighted that she agreed to co-host this with us and to lead today's panel. Laura, over to you. Thank you, Dean Galea, for these kind words and welcome again, everyone, to this webinar. So we have today, as Dean Galea was saying, an outstanding group of educators that will present insights in how to promote inclusivity and equity, two of the foundational values of our, of our educational systems, and now in an online environment. We invite all of you, all of the attendees, to please pose your questions in the Q&A uh, box during this, the session. First, we will hear from Dean Amy Fairchild, who is Dean and Professor at the College of Public Health at the Ohio State University. Dean Fairchild is a historian who works at the intersection of history, public health ethics, and public health policy and politics. Second, we will turn to Dr. Mark Kiviniemi, professor at the University of Kentucky College of Public Health, whose own work focuses on understanding how people make decisions about engaging in health-related behaviors, how individuals process and respond to information about their health, and how to communicate that information most effectively. Third, we will hear from Dr. Mary Catherine McNatt, Professor and Chair of Public Health at A.T. Steele University. Dr. Uh, McNatt has extensive experience in public health emergency preparedness, epidemiology, program planning, and social and behavioral health at both the academic and practice level. We will then hear from Dr. Shan Mohammed, who is a clinical professor at Northeastern University, Beauvais College of Health Science. Dr. Mohammed is the founding director of the Master of Public Health Program in Urban Health and oversees the program in areas of educational policy development, curricular design, and public health workforce development. Next, we will hear from Dr. Tricia Pennycock, the Vice Dean of, for Education and Faculty Affairs at the University of South Florida College of Public Health. In, in this role, she's responsible for the implementation of a strategic vision for innovation, innovation uh, and education that prepares public health professionals grounded in the science of public health. Last, but certainly not least, we will turn to BU School of Public Health own Associate Dean for Education, Lisa Sullivan. Dr. Sullivan is former chair of the Department of Biostatistics. She teaches biostatistics and quantitative methods for public health and was instrumental in developing a minor program in public health, which is open to undergraduate students at Boston University. Welcome all of our panelists, and thank you for being here today to share your insights in this important topic. Dean Amy Fairchild, to you. 
Thank you, Lara. Thank you, Sandro. Thank you, BU, for hosting, um, as always, a timely and, and provocative discussion at a, at a critical time in history. Um, what I'm going to do today is think about, uh, think about this from two angles. Think about it from the, the angle of getting in and when we, when we should think about getting into the digital space and when we should think about not getting into the digital space. Um, particularly focused on issues of, of equity, but also uh, think about what happens when we, we do get in. And, and I will be raising more questions than I, than I give solutions, but that's the, that's the privilege of, of historians since uh, uh, I, I have, my, my field takes me to looking backwards uh, often. Um, so to me, one of the challenges that we all know about uh, by now is that we need to expand access to digital platforms. Um, we have all been in contexts where uh, many of our students have not had the technology that they need to have in order to, to gain access to online education. They've not had the internet access. They've not had the computers. They've not had the laptops. They've not had the, the iPads. And uh, we know from research that, um, that while um, mostly white and higher income families um, the plans for their children's future remains largely intact in this context, but that for parents of, of color, for low income families, the number of obstacles between their children and higher education has increased and access to technology and internet, internet access is one of those, those, key, those key factors. Um, but um, internet access and technology access is not enough. For first generation students, the evidence shows uh, living at home and trying to work can mean that students are trying to balance education with serving as caregivers. They may be having to work to support their families, regardless of that, whether they live on or off campus, whether they're taking classes face to face or virtually. Um, but we also know that the success of the, the, that the success of first generation students bit, depends heavily on uh, a sense of support, on a sense of belonging, on real inclusion uh, on the university campus and in the classroom. And they may not receive um, this sense of inclusion virtually. And, and we're not talking just about participation in the classroom, but access to student clubs, to in-person advising, to sports, to office hours, to health services, to, to mental health services, to dining, um, to housing security. Um, and uh, of course, um, one of the things we have to think about too is that there are some rich, immersive face-to-face -face experiences that simply can't be replicated virtually. So I would caution that as we think about opportunities to learn um, anywhere for everyone, we need to continue to invest in and invest in in smarter ways uh, in the kinds of residential campus experiences that can promote CES and help achieve equity and inclusive excellence for a really important part of our student population. So I simply want to punctuate that the point that learning from anywhere should not exclude thinking about the role of a residential experience in a digital world and certainly um, all of us are having students on campus at this moment in time who are living in residence halls but taking classes face to face. Um, so as much energy as we put into the digital, I want to make sure that I'm underscoring this point that we should put just as much energy into thinking about how to reserve face to face experiences for what they do best. And what they do best is not necessarily information delivery. One of the things that we have found through research at The Ohio State University is that um, our students tend to prefer online digital experiences for the communication of information, but that when it comes to discussion sections, when it comes to collaborative work, online creates a lot of barriers to full participation and to a satisfactory experience for students. Um, now, from the perspective of, of inclusive excellence, um, digital, digital opportunities create a number of ways in which we can expand the reach, not just of public health, but of higher education 
in general. And this has important implications for equity and inclusion. We can reach new audiences. Um, so we, we need to be thinking not just about degree programs, but degree enhancement programs, the kinds of certificates that can promote education in a diverse workforce. Um, and this is gonna be particularly important uh, during and beyond um, the pandemic situation that we find ourselves in now. Um, from the perspective of inclusive excellence too, we have an opportunity to think about space in entirely new ways. Uh, most of us are coming together today, not from our offices, but from different kinds of spaces. And what we have an opportunity to ask now and to ask it with an eye to thinking about inclusion and inclusive excellence is what is the ideal teaching space? Um, and this is a question that we have to, to ask thinking not just about what counts as space in the digital world, but, um, but, uh, but the face-to-face the -face world too. We're all focused on, um, a lot of us are focused on full remote learning, but hybrid learning and high flex learning or are powerful ways to take advantage of, of both. And by hybrid, I'm talking about, I'm making sure we're all using the same language, the ways uh, in which we, one week can switch from virtual, the next week we can switch to face-to-face. -to -face. And the way we use high flex uh, on this campus is to mean that students can pick the ways they wanna engage in the classroom on any given day. They can do it synchronously, they can do it asynchronously, they can do it face-to-face, -face. they can do it virtually. Um, so most of our spaces in institutions right now are, are set up for a very different model of communication. It's a model of one-way communication from the instructor out to students. It's centered on a single focal point of knowledge in the room. And it has enormous impact, I think, on the participation of all students in the conversation and empowerment in the, in the classroom. And certainly we all have discussion spaces that can operate differently, but as I think some of us have learned, uh, having some of those discussions in a fruitful manner online can be, can be a challenge. So uh, as we think about what's needed to ensure inclusion in the digital space, um, there are two key factors I would want to, 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 to talk about just a little bit. And I know we don't have a lot of time as speakers, um, but from my perspective, there are things that we already knew. Um, the first is faculty preparedness for teaching in the, the digital space. Um, there's evidence that particularly for first year students, um, but, but also for students in general, uh, online courses uh, have been negatively related to collaborative learning, to the quality of interaction, and to discussion with diverse others, both faculty members and, and peers. Um, when online courses have improved access to education for non-traditional students, for underrepresented students, though another study found that collaborative learning and faculty student-faculty interaction sharply fell for online learners. Um, so these are some of the things that we need to keep in mind as we think about um, the potential and the limits of online space for equitable education. Um, so uh, to, to wrap things up um, on that front, uh, online shuts down some things, it opens up other things. From my experience, it has felt harder to me to stay in difficult conversations about racism, about discrimination, about bi bias in virtual spaces. It's harder to read the room. It's easier for people to check out. And that's why I would end with the point that curriculum matters. And talking about curriculum has brought me together with a number of people uh, on this call, Lara, Lisa, Sean, Mark, um, thinking about what the curriculum for the, the, the future of public health needs to be. We already knew um, that as a field, we don't often take the time we need to unpack racial, social, and ethnic disparities. Um, we, we can, in, in some colleges and programs, draw on things like critical race theory, uh, but we don't really have a critical public health theory. We can tend to be a very skills-based field 
And I have heard now from students at, at three institutions that we need to do a better job taking our time and walking students through the evidence and not assuming that everybody, everybody knows uh, how disparities get created. We can and do sometimes rely on older outmoded frames like international health as opposed to understanding global health as a distinct uh, framework and, and perspective that requires us to think about the exchange of knowledge, not just from the global north to the global south, but to the global south outward. So I think as we think about spaces that are physical or digital, we can't do that in a way that promotes equity and inclusion if we don't um, think about the mission and goals of what our education is going to look like. But if we don't undertake a careful curricular review, what courses are we teaching? How are we teaching it? How are we training faculty to, to um, explain, unpack, address the social determinants of, of health? And this is going to become uh, more and more important. Um, it's always been important for our field. But the thing that differentiates this moment is other people see it as important and it's going to become vital for us to do it in a way that that models that for uh, the other disciplines in the rest of the university. So with that, I think I've I think I've exceeded my eight minutes, but I'm I'm wrapped up. Thank you, Dean Fairchild. Mark. Yeah, th thank you so much, Laura, and uh, thank you to uh, the Boston University uh, School of Public Health for, for inviting me to be a part of this. Um, because of some technological glitches, which are part and parcel for uh, digital education, Meredith is going to help me uh, with slides. What I'd like to do with my opening remarks is talk a little bit about some dimensions of educational equity that I and my colleagues uh, in the Department of Health Behavior and Society uh, at the College of Public Health at the University of Kentucky have really come to appreciate uh, through the course of the pandemic more than I at least did beforehand. And I, I, I want to introduce you to those dimensions of equity by telling you a story about one of our students and her experiences during the pandemic. Other than changing her name, everything about this story is exactly like what, what, exactly what happened. Uh, so Leah was one of our first year uh, MPH students in health behavior uh, in fall of 2019. In fall of 2019, when we were in person, she was a terrific engaged student, involved in classes, had a real passion for public health, exactly the sort of student uh, that, that, that we love to have in our MPH programs. Spring of 2020 came and it was exactly the same thing. Uh, she was taking a course from me and from several of, of my colleagues in spring of 2020, it was very engaged. We at the University of Kentucky did what probably everybody else in the room did, which is on about two days notice, went from being a 100% in-person MPH program to being a 100% online MPH program. And the first week of that continued uh, the same pattern Leah was in class, she was engaged, she was there. And then all of a sudden she was gone. And several of my faculty came and said, you know, we discussed student concerns quite a bit in those early days. And as we were discussing those, several faculty had the concern that suddenly she wasn't there. And so faculty reached out to her, our student services uh, staff in the college reached out to her. And it took almost two weeks before we got kind of a very fuzzy, uh, you know, cell phone call from her that explained the situation. And, and here's what happened. And Meredith, if you would go to, to the next slide. So when the University of Kentucky shut down and went remote, uh, Leah went from her dorm room uh, on campus at the University of Kentucky back to her home in one of our Eastern Kentucky uh, counties in rural Appalachia. Uh, almost half of the state of Kentucky uh, is part of, of the, the Appalachian region. Uh, I myself am a product of Appalachia, something that I have a real passion for. Um, and we at the University of Kentucky have a number of students you know, from, from the area. The first week for Leah was great because the public library in her county had internet access. And so she stayed fine. But then the library closed because of the pandemic. And she went to her home, you know, and tried to use her cell phone as a hotspot to get to class and it didn't work. And so suddenly she was gone from our program because of uh, those experiences. Now, once we finally connected with her, and again, it took two weeks and, and multiple reach outs from faculty and staff, 
we were able to take advantage of infrastructure that the University of Kentucky had put in place for the pandemic. We were able to connect her with an internet hotspot that the university provided to her. And in the third week, once that was done, she was back and she was engaged and she was in class again. Now, one thing to take from that story is that I have the privilege of leading an amazing group of faculty who have gone so far above and beyond expectations in meeting the challenges of the pandemic that I can't say enough good things about, and that we have an amazing student services staff uh, at, at the university. Both of those things are true. But the point that I want to make now is that there are some things that I think we are all doing to make distance education work for our students in the high pressure emergency response, get it done a uh, time that public health is so very good at, that may become impediments in the long term. And I think there's three dimensions to, to that equity that, that, that Leah's story really illustrates. And Meredith, if you would, would go to the next slide, please. The first of those relates very much to, to something that Amy uh, talked about in her talk, and that's the idea of structural equity. So the real issue that came up for Leah is that she lacked access, right? She did not have internet access at home, and that's a combination of infrastructure in, in the Appalachian region, uh, socioeconomic status, a, 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 and so on. But the structural pieces necessary to engage in online learning simply weren't there for her. And in the time of COVID-19, part of the university's emergency response was to provide internet access for our students. But I don't think we can take that as a given as digital learning continues into the future. And in the same way that we all have become, if we weren't already very aware of structural racism over the past months, we need to be aware of the structural equity components that affect our students' educational experiences. And as we're moving into the digital environment, Make sure that that access to internet, access to a quiet place to study, access to the ability to contact other students and faculty and so on uh, is there and there for all of our students. So structural equity is one dimension that I think is critical for us as we take the lessons from the pandemic and move on to in, in, in advancing digital learning. Meredith, if you would do the next slide. The second thing that I think is very true about Leah's story is that getting her connected with the resources that allowed her to continue her educational journey happened because a number of our faculty in health behavior and society reached out to her. They recognized that she wasn't there because of a relationship that they had built. They connected with her. Our student services class knew how to get her to the resources. What wasn't involved was Leah thinking, I'm stuck. Right? I can't continue with my education at this point. I'm sure the university has something. How do I get it? And that's something that is very important for us to think about as we think about equity in the digital space. Meredith, if you would go to the next slide. And that's the issue of what I'll call navigational equity. We know that there are differences in students both proactive willingness to reach out and ask for assist assistance in students knowledge of how the system works and what kind of assistance may be there and then on the flip side there are sometimes differences in the system's willingness to respond to those students in ways that our first generation students our students of color our students from low socioeconomic status do not have the same equity and, and, and resources in navigating our educational systems and our environments to access the services that are available to them. In Leah's case, and I think one of the things that works for us in the in-person environment is that we do build relationships with our students in the classroom. It happens pretty naturally in an in-person space. We see when they're not there and when they're not connected. And all of those things become harder and much more intentional when we move to the online space and to the, the, the digital environment. And so I think if we are going to have true educational equity in a digital space, if we are going to provide public health education for all, we need to think very carefully about how we deal with those issues of knowledge, feelings that it's appropriate to ability to in response to navigating the system uh, across students from different backgrounds. Now, the last dimension of equity that I want to talk about is one where I don't need to use a pseudonym anymore because it's my reality and the reality, I think, for many of you, and uh, Meredith, if you go forward one more slide, 
And that's the case that for many of our instructors, all of these efforts take far more energy and far more time and far more effort than they do when we're in person. And for many of our, our faculty, many of our instructors, they're doing uh, what I'm doing, which is they're running a homeschool, which you can see here, uh, out of our family room, uh, at the same time that I'm trying to, to, to lead an academic department and, and, and do my own work. In my department, over half of my faculty and staff have school-aged children because of the current state of the pandemic in Kentucky, our public schools are 100% remote. Um, this, this is a nationwide uh, situation. Uh, Chronicle of Higher Ed today reported that two-thirds of faculty say that right now they are either extremely stressed or very stressed. My only response to that is that I'm surprised it's only two thirds, but it brings up, I think, a final issue of equity that we need to consider. And Meredith, if you would uh, go forward one more slide. And that's the idea that what we do in building these structures for digital education has to allow for sustainable equity. I cannot say enough about the amazing work that the faculty and staff in the Department of Health, Behavior and Society and the College of Public Health have done to help our students learn, help them navigate the pandemic, deal with their emotional responses, you know, we can go on and on. And it simply isn't sustainable to do it at the level that we are right now with the kind of very hands-on, one-on-one you know, uh, responses that, 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 that are taking place. I do think that an outcome of the pandemic is going to be a move towards additional digital learning. And I, and I think that in many ways, that's a good outcome, but we have to think about how we do it in a way that allows our faculty and staff to feel like they can do their jobs and do them well without feeling very or extremely stressed. So Meredith, if you would go to the last slide. Um, so, so in thinking about the, those, those issues of structural, navigational, and sustainable equity. Hopefully what we can do as public health educators is create a world where all of our students are able to get on the path with us structurally and have the resources to do it, to stay on that path by navigating the systems that they need in place. And for us to be able to continue to have us all uh, stay on that journey and, and do it together in a healthy and sustainable way. So thank you very much. I look forward to the discussion. Great, thank you so much, Dr. Kivinim. So Dr. Mary Catherine McNutt. All right, thank you. Um, I'm gonna share my screen real quick. All right, so I have a little bit different perspective as well. Um, we come from a little bit of different background. We've been actually doing online learning quite a bit um, longer than some of the other programs. And so we have a little bit of different view. Um, first of all, there's two main types of online learning, reactive teaching, which is what many of the schools had to do in March when we saw COVID come and was a pretty much reactive in response to COVID, turn around, switch teaching pretty as, as quickly as they could. And then there's careful planning and designing of online courses. What I'm going to talk about today is online courses from the planning and designing. We've been doing online teaching since 1999 in our program. Um, from our perspective, Online teaching, if it's done right and planned well, it can create an environment of educational equity more so than the brick and mortar typical style design. We have students all over that can do learning of any kind. We've seen, it, it, we've seen students pretty much from South America doing as a health advisor all the way down to in Nigeria who are doing mission work um, in Honduras who are you know, with sick grandparents in the military. Um, the single parents, working parents, double parents, and we have a lot of dual degree students, students, medical um, physicians, dentists, uh, a lot of rural students, um, students who um, do their work in between classes, in between um, rounds, and it pretty much opens the doors for all of them. Um, while the diversity is great, it does also create some of our challenges. And with increased diversity in students, it also creates a need for a shift in learning pedagogy. Uh, one of the things we do know is that adult learners, when you have more diversity, it shifts it to um, adult learners need to have that experiential and applied learning more so than the moderator at the front of the room. Um, not so much the traditional, I'm speaking to you, but involve me, let me learn, let me have some hands-on learning. And traditional course syllabuses don't work in an online course. They have to be shifted. 
The other thing we do notice is that subject matter experts, while our faculty know the content of the faculty, they are not necessarily course designers, um, which becomes a problem if you have them developing courses in a silo, which is really important to make sure they're not developing them by themselves, but rather have a whole continuity of individuals developing them together. When we develop courses, we don't just have a faculty work on them, but a whole common group of people. We have usually two or three subject matter experts, instructional designers, um, and a very diverse group of people. We make sure that the courses are interactive in nature. They have a lot of applied um, experiential content. They're checked and have a lot of checks and balances by our curriculum committee, um, um, outside stakeholders, um, and also one of the other large challenges and common mistakes we see is individuals going in and recording full lectures. Um, a lot of that was with the just-in-time learning, um, but you still do see sometimes adults, uh, in general, you have about three to five minutes of their attention. So you wanna make sure that you capture short, small videos. When you're in the online course, it's really, you're able to get a lot of different, hit up the different learning styles. I'll get to that in just a second. One of the other challenges is when individuals don't use learning management systems in their courses. But being able to use a learning management system is a great way to organize the material. And then no consistency among courses. Students really like to have that consistency. Um, we're seeing that whether it, you know, the research does substantiate that and whether it's, you know, these, you know, high school students, what we're seeing now with through COVID all the way up through higher education. And so what works? What have we seen work? So we have done a lot of research and um, things like that throughout the years. And what we've seen is through, especially in adult learners, interactive and collaborative learning is very, very important. And it also does create a sense of community. When students have that sense of community, you get a higher graduation rate, a higher retention rate, and that is very, very important. And that, and when, especially in the online environment, you don't want them to feel like they're alone. And that's really important, especially right now during COVID. So what we do and what we've done and seen to work is before students even come to school, they have an orientation and our um, advisors will call the students. They'll have personal phone calls with the students. We do keep our course 15 students per course. They have all their courses are taught by faculty and they learn from the faculty's experiences. All, our, all the faculty have experiential knowledge in the field and we make sure that they do have that it, time to or learn from the faculty. While our courses are asynchronous, many of our faculty do have do live Zoom sessions. Um, we have a student Facebook group, and there are other opportunities for them to learn and meet their peers. Um, and that fostering that personal connections with students is very important, whether you're a faculty member, their academic advisors. The academic advisors are in the courses weekly, and they have to, and he mentioned it in, earlier in his first presentation, that that student support and being able to sustain that is really important. And that is something that we have worked on throughout the years because we have noticed that that is huge and very, very critical to student retention and student success rates, as well as to their overall, um, overall happiness throughout the program. So if we notice if a student hasn't shown up a day, hasn't shown up a week, faculty will reach out to them, the academic advisors will reach out to them, and they do develop these personal relationships with the academic advisors, with the other students, we had a student, for example, that had had a, a child in the hospital. We call her every day because she needed that support from us. She didn't have any family in, in the area. Um, so you do form these personal relationships. It's also important to make sure that you're engaged in the course. We do have you know, standards, but our faculty are very involved. Consistency is important with all the quality matters standards. Make sure the students like the courses to kind of look similar. Um, the faculty do are able to interact, but they, the students like to go into a course and know where the syllabus is, where the discussions are, where the assessments are. Um, again, with the experiential and authentic learning, one of the things we're doing, like they say, you have to move fast to go slow, is we are adding a lot of experiential and authentic learning. I say authentic learning, meaning um, a few years ago, CPH changed the way that they do the CPH exam to actually want it to mimic what students learn in the field. So we have since gone on and added, you know, authentic and experiential learning into all our courses so that by the time they reach their 
ILE and the practicum at the end of the program, they would have had um, actual experiential learning all the way throughout the program. So not just in the ILE, but every course has actual experiences of what they'll do. For example, the preparedness course has actual tabletops and that they're running and writing after action reports. And the epidemiology course has outbreak scenarios and the global health course has 360 um, cultural immersions that they can go through. And that's another one with making sure they have that health equity. Um, when you're designing the courses, you have to keep in mind that, you know, these students are all over the place. You don't want to put in anything where they have to buy expensive VR glasses or need a whole lot of bandwidth because you want to make sure that they can do the assessments on tablets, on phones, on devices so that you're not keeping anyone out of, you know, out of the program or you know, costing a lot of money or a lot of internet. And of course, everything is ADA compliant. Um, opportunities. One of the big things is collaboration. Um, as you know, we we, um, we do have the luxury of having instructional designers. I do know a lot of programs don't have that. And our instructional designers are more than willing to um, help other schools and programs move that pendulum from reactive to just in time. And also we noticed that with the pandemic, many individuals were afraid to sign up for the whole degree and rather they wanted to just focus on the, the pandemic relevant stuff. Our, we have a, um, a program with the CHCs in the area because one of our missions is to work for rural underserved areas and get students in those areas. So we developed a public health emergency preparedness and disaster response certificate so that we can make, try to get as many public health workers in those areas for a response for a pandemic as we could. The other thing that I think is really important is to never stop learning and improving. Um, our courses are great, the students love them, but we're constantly trying to improve them so that they can be even more experiential, more learning, more authentic learning. Um, how else can, what else can we do to help the students feel part of the program to, you know, have them feel engaged? And at the, um, the end of the day, we just want to remember our mission, um, you know, we're in this for public health and to help the communities and what else can we do to keep improving that? And as far as the future, um, you know, we feel that the future is in online learning. It, it makes it accessible for, you know, individuals with disabilities, with, you know, children, with pretty much, you know, all the way around. So that's sort of where we're at with online learning. All right, thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. McNabb. So now is the turn with Dr. Mohammed. Great, thank you so much. Um, so my comments today are really informed by um, a few experiences that have uh, guided me in my thinking about what does inclusion mean when we think about the digital environment. So my background is as a family physician and I learned a lot from working with patients, particularly adolescents um, and working with them on substance misuse and risky sexual behavior. And this idea of when do people feel like they belong also, I'm currently serving and have served for the last five years at Northeastern as faculty in residence. So I'm actually here in a residence hall, uh, which houses a thousand students. And uh, my role here is to help them find personal and professional fulfillment as they are pursuing lives of meaning and purpose. And that has helped me understand when students feel connected and when they don't. Um, so the comments that I have are really about expanding inclusion to thinking about belonging. We know that students bring their complex lives into the classroom. There are some identities that they share. We know about intersectionality and the importance of, do they sense that I'm welcome in the classroom? Whoops. And let me back up, sorry for that. And do I belong in the classroom? Uh, the other component is, am I safe, right? And we know that that is not just in terms of with an instructor, but also with their peer group. Can I trust those in authority? And do you really care about me? Do you value my experiences, what I bring to this? And do I feel engaged? Am I committed to the learning that's going on here? How much do I wanna be here? And then finally, do I belong? And so as we think about that lived experience for students, 
um, we can think about the unique challenges and opportunities that teaching in a digital or a hybrid environment uh, might have on the student experience. So there are a lot of studies out about inclusive pedagogy and there are wonderful checklists um, that I encourage folks to think about and to have a look at because what we realize is that this time is demanding new skills, new competencies for us. Do we have the ability to reflect on our own biases and do we understand our own complex paths that might uh, interfere or actually help us work to create a more inclusive environment? What happens, you know, as Mark mentioned, when we're stressed and we're trying to deal with all of our life stuff, can we be as generous and hospitable as possible? How do we foster an inclusive learning environment? Are we welcoming? And then, um, as Mary Catherine mentioned, how are we actually doing with implementing what we've designed in terms of clear course content? And do we allow for students to bring their whole selves to the classroom and demonstrate in a variety of different ways their learning, their knowledge, their competencies? And how is it that ultimately we're thinking about the diversity that we see when students come into the classroom and that's hidden beneath the surface? How is it that we access those previous um, experiences that students might have that can benefit the experience or influence it? And what I'm particularly struck by uh, these days is thinking about trauma. So I like SAMHSA's definition of trauma um, and that it's really from the perspective of the individual. It's not what I hear happened or what you tell me, but it's what is the reaction and the reality for um, our students. And so this can be um, physical, it can be emotional harm, but ultimately these experiences are influencing their ability um, in terms of their well being. And this goes on for our faculty as well. And so, in addition to inclusive teaching, there's probably a lot that we can gain from taking a perspective of how do we teach best to those who have been traumatized. And I think certainly in our political environment these days, as well as with COVID, there's also the threat of ongoing traumas that potentially need to be addressed. And so then the competencies look similar to inclusive teaching, but they also might be a little bit different in terms of having a trusting presence, having transparency and predictability, the importance of no surprises for students, um, having an opportunity for them to cultivate strong relationships with their peers in meaningful ways that convey the sense of belonging. Um, and so in the online environment, how does that happen? Through chats, through discussion boards, through assignments, through group work, et cetera. How can we collaborate uh, more effectively? Additionally, how do we empower them? Um, I'm reminded of an author who talks about how do we give students islands of success where they have these victories throughout the course that cultivate a sense of uh, empowerment, self-efficacy, et cetera. And at the same time, how do we acknowledge the variety of cultural and historical issues that might be at play um, as relates to the course content and just within the context of our institutions, our cities, our towns, our geographic locations. And ultimately leading students to see why this is important, why they should care about this, why it relates to their personal and professional sense of meaning and purpose. And so the last component that I want to really bring home is that this is an unprecedented time for all of us. We're trying to figure out what has worked in the past, what can I learn from others, and as I'm trying to do something new, is it working or not? And so the scholarship of teaching and learning is critical at this time in terms of helping all of us advance in the digital domain. So I like the fact that it's about challenging us and invigorating us to take on these questions and these challenges. And through the sharing of our experiences, we're able to build a community of educators together. We don't have to sweat alone and we can get inspired and we can gain support from others through this um, inquiry process that says, how am I teaching and how are my students learning, right? So the goal is that we take the time to look deeply at what we're doing 
And I think when we talk about bringing the lens of the scholarship of teaching and learning to this area of inclusivity, belonging, um, there are a lot of different places where there are unanswered questions. And we can think about what is it that we're doing in terms of training each other? What methods work well for um, getting these competencies that we've mentioned for our faculty, but also for our staff and our students? This goes to um, Dean Fairchild's point in the very beginning about learning happens everywhere all the time, right? So the context in which students are living their lives, even when they're completely digital, can have an impact on how they have a sense of belonging. So how do we train everybody up? What are the new skills that are needed? Going to Mary Catherine's point, this idea of how do we actually design in a new environment? I've taught online courses and I've taught in classroom and now I'm teaching hybrid where I'm in a classroom with a small percentage of students with video cameras and microphones, but I have to wear a mask. And so then I'm thinking, well, how am I connecting with students, right? So I'm asking, I'm living these questions myself at this point, but how do we change what we do, whether it's synchronous or asynchronous to address um, these goals of inclusion? And then finally, this idea that all of what we do happens in a context. So what are our, whether we're, whatever level we're at, if we're at, um, middle school, high school, college, graduate, et cetera, what are those program department and institutional factors that can help support us in better inclusive teaching? So whether that's things that can incentivize us to do that inquiry and to um, engage in the scholarship of teaching and learning, what is it that gets valued in terms of our promotion um, and our tenure? How do we need to rethink our teaching evaluations? And is what I'm doing actually having the impacts that, that I want? And then finally, this idea of institutional climate and culture. We know that this has changed dramatically over time. We're under stress uh, currently in terms of a variety of factors. And so the goal is that if we can collectively maybe do a little more of the scholarship of teaching and learning process, saying, let me go up to the balcony, take a look at where I'm at. Let me think about what are the critical questions that I'm struggling to figure out? And then is there an approach that I can take to look at the literature? And one of the pieces that I'll just close with is that this is not all out there. The answers aren't there necessarily. And so we have to look to promising practices. We have to look to new ways of collecting data. And maybe it's not gonna be the perfect study that can get published, but it's gonna be information that can collectively help us all do our job a little bit better in this challenging time. So with that, I will wrap up and I look forward to questions afterwards. Thank you so much, Dr. Mohammed. Vice Dean Pennycock, to you. Hello, everybody. Thank you so much, Dean Galea, Dr. Sullivan, and Dr. Magana for this invitation. It's really a privilege to be with you today to talk about this very important issue, something that we should have been thinking about for a while and that should not have taken us by surprise. Um, some schools and programs have had the experience of teaching in the online media for a while. Others had to quickly do a transformation in the way they taught and learned in March, but I think that we have all learned so much um, in these months. And I think this is a very good opportunity to kind of take a step back and think about what this means for in the future. As Dean Galea said at the beginning, um, if we do not take this opportunity to really transform education, especially education in public health, we will be missing a wonderful chance to really get to look at things the way they can be, because there is nothing that forces us to reconsider what we're doing and to actually change what we're doing as facing situations like the ones we're facing now. And in the minutes that I have, I would like to take um, this time to invite you to take a look at um, teaching and learning from anywhere for everyone from the perspective of how we strategically plan public health education. So as we know, it cannot only be about who we teach or who teaches or what we teach, where we teach it, how we teach it, but it has to be ideally all of these factors together. 
And um, that is what I would like to spend a little bit of time talking about. This is an excellent opportunity for us to think about how we are framing our policies and our procedures in everything that has to do, not only with our students, but with our faculty. Why is that? This cannot be just about um, being able to speak only to those students who be, we believe are at a disadvantage in online learning, because this may be not only the way they have to learn today, but it may end up being the way they have to work in the future. So how do we help our students make that transition from the traditional brick and bricks and mortar learning to a world where they may have to work primarily online, where they may have to have jobs that are remote, remote where they will have to navigate and balance their life and their children and the challenges of of communication and transportation in the way that this may be for a while, if not forever. So this is an opportunity not only for us to think about how we include them in our teaching, but also how we help them to develop the skills they need to work in a world that needs to be more inclusive, that is probably more digital, more remote, and will probably never be the way it used to be. So if we think of this as something that we're doing for a while, until we get back to normal, until the vaccine is developed, designed and distributed, until we conquer COVID, and we believe that this is just a pause in our journey um, in public health education, and we do not take this opportunity to actually transform the way we think about public health education, we're missing a wonderful opportunity to actually transform not only education, but our students' lives and our own lives as faculty. As we have been navigating this in USF in the College of Public Health, we decided that we were going to, as part of an academic master plan, weave in a, comp a comprehensive strategy to address systemic racism. And the reason I'm bringing this up um, in this space is because we decided that we were not only going to look at the curriculum, everything from the course level competencies, how we teach, what we teach, the examples we use, the assessment opportunities, not only from the course level and making sure that it was, wasn't only one or two designated courses that would deal with this issue, but that students were able to find consistency in our entire curriculum a respect, a celebration of our diversity and what it means as they go out into the world and work with diverse populations, but that they should also see it in the way that we recruit our students, in the way that we make sure that they progress to graduation in a timely fashion, in the way that we make sure that their practical experiences are in diverse situations where they experience different communities, not only as needing to be helped or served, but also as learning from and being supervised by people of different um, and diverse backgrounds and um, opportunities. And also, when, once they got into um, the workforce, that opportunity for them to stay connected with us and not only based on the chemistry that can exist between students who naturally align to certain faculty members because of whatever characteristic, but a systematic way of making sure that all our students are connected to us as a college. So not only the curriculum, not only the way we recruit and help students go from being students all the way to being our alumni and part of the workforce, but also in our faculty. So it is so important for students to be able to see themselves reflected and represented in the classroom, not only learning about different populations, but seeing themselves in their faculty, in the administration of the school or college, in the opportunities that they get to interact with guest speakers. The inclusivity cannot only be something that we think about today in how do we make students who may not have access to technology, access to internet, um, the opportunity for a quiet space, 
to be able to feel that they belong and are part of the school's community, but it also needs to include their understanding of how we in public health value the worth that we see in making sure that everybody not only is heard, but also listens. And that is something that goes um, beyond what we're doing necessarily just to face the pandemic. And that also goes to how we intentionally plan everything that we're doing in public health education. So I really appreciate this opportunity to talk about this with you. I am encouraged by initiatives like this that guarantee that this isn't something that will just pass us by and we'll go back to normal, which I think will never happen. But this is a wonderful opportunity for us to grow and transform the way we educate not only our students, but also each other as faculty members. Thank you for the opportunity. Thank you, Vaisin. Jenny Cook. Now let's go to Dr. Sullivan. To wrap Thank up. you. Uh, let me share my screen. That's showing okay? Mm -hmm. So what I'd like to talk about is inclusive, equitable excellence in education. And I apologize for repeating some of what others have said. I guess that's just uh, what happens when you go last after such an illustrious panel. So uh, what is it? Um, it's offering the best course of study for intellectual and social development for all students, creating environments that challenge every student, providing supports for every student to achieve their full potential, valuing all students, creating a welcoming community, and empowering students. At the institutional level, it is our responsibility to ensure equitable educational outcomes for underrepresented students. But in order to achieve this, we have to be open and prepared to change policies and practices. The transition to remote, hybrid, high flex, whatever you wanna call it, teaching and learning, disproportionately benefited already advantaged students. It was easiest for well-resourced schools, faculty and students, widening a gap that was already there. Pre-pandemic, most of us operated with one of these two modalities, in-person or online. And in-person, we capitalize on real-time interactions and discussions. Content is delivered per a set schedule and faculty can adapt to things that are happening in real time in the classroom. Online, we have highly structured learning experiences and the content is created specifically for self-paced asynchronous learning. And we all switched very quickly. Mary Catherine was a little bit more generous saying it was reactive. I say it was a bit of a panic uh, in March to remote, hybrid, high flex, whatever you call it. And in some places, it's really not much evolved from video conferencing. And this isn't to put blame on people, it requires substantial investment in faculty training and in technology in order to do this right and to do it well. I've heard lots of people talking about how difficult, and I'm doing it myself, it is difficult. The hybrid environment is quite challenging, but I've heard people say they can't wait till we get back to the way it used to be. So I just like to remind us that the way it used to be wasn't always as good as it could have been. So these are pictures not of students in our classrooms today. These are students who were in our classrooms pre-pandemic, checked out, bored, checking something else. So this isn't all these issues that we're struggling with in the remote hybrid environment aren't entirely new. So inclusive teaching and learning involves lots of things, but Doing the inclusive teaching and learning remotely involves the same principles that were important for our face-to-face -face courses, but now we have to add things like digital access, cultural issues, all the things that my fellow panelists have mentioned. It involves deliberate course design and structure, variety in assessments so that students with different learning styles and strengths can demonstrate what they can do, frequent low stakes assessments to let students have those victories, those small wins, build confidence, high impact practices, active learning, 
It's getting to know students as individuals, what they can contribute to a classroom, removing invisible barriers for us, particularly in public health, where we focus so heavily on group work, making sure we understand what prohibits someone from participating to their full potential in a group. And others have already said, we must create community and a sense of belonging. Our traditional methods have not always served all students well. And this is a time that we can think about all of these things and maybe make some real long overdue changes. So there certainly are challenges with remote teaching and learning. And I think every faculty doing it will say, it's really hard to engage students. They feel isolated, distracted. Everyone has Zoom fatigue. I think everybody has experienced that over the last few months. It's difficult to produce quality educational experience. This is a true course design challenge. The issue of student support was already raised. Mark had the story of Leah. You know, we've got to identify in real time students who need to get connected. This is especially difficult from a distance. And rigor is another issue. In this environment, it's actually hard to think about protecting academic integrity when the modalities are so different and we have to be so flexible. But I would say there are lots of opportunities here for us as well. In terms of engaging students, there are some superb technologies that produce meaningful social interaction, help to engage students that might otherwise sit very quietly in a classroom to build community. In terms of quality educational experiences, there are technologies that can help promote active learning, allow students to engage in important problems, to do simulations, things that they, we haven't done in, even in our face-to-face -face classes. In terms of student support, we cannot, those of us who are fortunate to be in schools with outstanding offices of student services, graduate student life, education, the registrar, wellness offices, our career offices, these are absolutely essential, particularly in this environment to make sure that we can support students. And there are different, new and different ways that we can do it. We have virtual access, Zoom appointments, drop-in sessions that, that students can get connected. And in terms of rigor, again, it was already mentioned about using learning management systems. There are lots of opportunities for us to vary assignments for students to develop higher order skills and to build confidence. So I would argue there are many, many options out there, yet education remains one of the least digitized sectors. I'm not saying we shift over entirely to all these technologies, but they can do a lot for us, no matter what modality we move to once we get through this pandemic time. So I hope that some of the things that we're learning and will continue to learn as part of remote, hybrid, high flex teaching and learning will be part of a permanent restructuring. Hopefully we will move away from crisis response and into something that becomes more uh, palatable, something that we can all feel confident with. We need to rethink student outcomes, expectations, and strategies. Focus on meaningful, relevant learning for all students. We have to continue to adapt, and this is a mindset. And it's one that is not usually that, that well, um, that, that our faculty are very comfortable with, but it's something that we have to continue to do is adapt to different situations. And the point has already been made, we have to do in everything we do, strive for connection and community building for ourselves, for our students and for our field. So I'll just end with two things we, I think we need to do, continue with every possible effort to disrupt systems of inequity and at the institutional level, reconsider diversity as an initiative to thinking about inclusive excellence as a necessary condition for educational excellence. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Sullivan. Well, oh, I don't know you, but I have been just taking notes. This session has been really been amazing. A lot of wonderful and thoughtful ideas to move forward. And one of the things that I really want to emphasize is that this is the greatest opportunity that we have in order to really reshape higher education and especially uh, public health education. This is our opportunity. And I'm so, I feel so inspired and motivated just to hear all of you uh, because we have, we know 
what we need to do. We need to now, I think that individually, first in our own institutions, but then collectively. So I'm proud that at ASPPH, the Association of Schools and Programs of Public Health, we are already thinking collectively about how can we do in order to reshape uh, education. So with all the initiatives, all the thoughts that you're having, I'm, I'm sure we're gonna end up having a really very you know, powerful education for the future. So thank you all for all your, your insights. We, we were hoping to have a little bit of conversation among ourselves before uh, uh, going to the Q&A, but it's just like so rich that I really, uh, I'm thanking all of you. And I think that we have a lot of information. We have a lot of uh, uh, areas that we're gonna continue this discussion in our own institutions, but of course in, in ASAPH too. But I would like to go to some of the questions because we have some questions, we have uh, you know not much time. So I'm gonna pick some of the questions and then for the ones that we maybe not have the time to reach all of them, we're certainly gonna continue maybe answering the questions uh, offline. So there's one question about undergraduate and graduate education, which I would like to, uh, to, to read to you to see who wants to answer. And the question is the following that comes from Karin. What differences are you experiencing between undergraduate and graduate students? Not only are there academic uh, differences among students, there seem to be skills and characteristics that are necessary for success in the digital environment. So can, who wants to, to uh, answer to that question and to reflect on that? I can start us off. Um, you know, I teach both undergraduate and graduate students. And I would say that there's even a difference between those students who are in their first year of undergrad and then those who are returning. I think one of the biggest challenges is managing expectations of students at whatever level. And so the first year students, this is their college experience. They don't, haven't known anything different. And so they're all in it together. They're asking questions, trying to figure out how to make it work and how to adjust. The students who are returning are well aware of what they're missing. And I think managing those expectations and helping them focus on skill development is always important in terms of the transparency of what's needed. And for graduate students, it's the complexity of real life. You know, they are dealing with um, spouses, family members, et cetera. And so I find one universal commonality is how do we help students be present in the moment for the class at that given time and uh, give them opportunity to sort of settle into this opportunity to learn and whatever they can learn is great. But I think universally, this these mindful practices are so important to give people a safe space a time to take a breath as they're trying to manage all of their own expectations and then the external pressures. Um, so I think that's one thing that's really struck me as being um, a bit different than a year ago in terms of the traditional differences between an undergraduate student and a graduate student. And so I'll just say, I think that that's where Zoom can be really fun, you know, through the chat, you know, every day, every class saying, we're gonna put a different Zoom background share something, put your favorite food as your Zoom background, put your place that makes you happy and creates less stress. So I think those are universal across the spectrum of student learners just to help them belong and be present. Could I add just a little bit to that? And I think that even for those of us, you, you've taught the same class over and over and over again, it's not the same this semester, it's never the same any semester, but this is completely different. So. It requires a lot of checking in with students. So even though they might be same year, same place in their program, the world is so different and putting so much stress and, and pressure on people, you have to just keep checking in with students over and over again. I think it changes week to week. So anything to you know, get feedback from students you know, in a quick little survey or just even anonymous uh, cards or whatever you can do, I think is very helpful to understand where they are and what they're hoping to achieve. So one thing that our faculty have mentioned and that I've also noticed in class is that what students are asking for is different. They may say that they wanna talk about an assignment or 
question about something or what's next or a test, but at the end of the day, what they really want to talk about is some other type of need, some emotional need, mental health issues. Um, so whatever is happening in the class is kind of like a window to actually address what it is they're concerned about. And for faculty, that has meant a couple things. Number one, we're not necessarily ready or prepared to respond to some of the needs the students have. So being able to detect and knowing how to refer students that may be having mental health issues that require more than a pat in the back and I know how you're feeling and may actually need some more you know, robust support is something that we need to be able to provide faculty with. And that's something that we have seen, not only as faculty, but even as administrators, the, the um, responsibility of the mental health of our students is even more evident in this time. And the second is um, the expectations. So especially the students like Sean mentioned that have been here before will say, well, this course has always been about shadowing. When will I get to do that? Um, um, tell me about what it's going to look like in the spring. Even students who haven't ever taken the course but are looking in the future want to know what's going to happen, like if we could read crystal balls. So being able to manage those expectations and helping them to, you know, transition from the hopefully we'll get back to normal to this is where we are now. And you need to think about your education in this space and in this time. And what you can still learn and gain is also something that we can help our faculty, our faculty, and be able to talk to students about. Kind of put along the lines of what she said, how a lot of the students are needing a lot more emotional support. Our students have had a lot of extra needs these this past year as well. And one of the things we've heard a lot of our students say is one of their only consistencies has been school and has been their faculty. And I think for those reasons, it's been so important that they know, you know, the course expectations, they know the faculty is going to be there, they, they know what the assessments are going to be. And having that as well as the extra engagement with the faculty, our faculty have been having a lot of Zooms um, with the students and in groups, individually, um, at all hours. And the students have really liked that, but that's given them a lot of extra support. And they have said, you know, school's been our only constant. And having had that comfort has really kind of helped them through the term. And, and I, I know we're not at that question, but someone asked why an LMS was so important because that was their constant. School was their constant. It was sort of their teddy bear. Um, and that helped them, that has helped them. And so that was sort of an answer to two questions at once. And I think one thing I, I would add in terms of the undergraduates versus graduates, but I think something we need to think about more broadly is going back to what we know about high impact practices for undergraduate education and how we need to modify those for a digital context. So we know, for example, a robust first year experience, right, makes a difference. And the reason that that makes a difference is in large part because that's where our students who are just coming into the door, learn the skills, coming to class, note taking, how to use the library, how to avoid access academic dishonesty, right? All those sorts of things. We also know that one-on-one -on -one relationships with faculty members matter, right? And so I think, you know, one of the things we have to think about for all of our students in the move to digital is how do we create the digital versions of those high impact experiences? And that's both giving the same skills that are necessary regardless of context, but also I, I think, you know, Karen's question highlights that there are some specific skills that are either different or at least more important, right, in a remote online uh, format than they are in person. And, and so we have to reimagine that. I think the difference I see between our undergraduates and our graduates is that the gr undergraduates are coming in without skills and they're learning a set of online skills, right, that, 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 that are there as they always have done coming in and having a first year experience, it's just different. Our graduate students are figuring out how to translate what worked for them in person in their previous experience experiences and to translate that into the on online environment. So I think everybody is making a transition, but it's a very fundamentally different experience, right, for the, for the different kinds of students. Yeah, I think that too is where orientation is important, but also one of the things when you're designing the assessments, I know we really look at blooms and as we and go through the courses as they we go through the program we start out with the lower blooms and increase blooms from you know knowledge all the way up through application and I think that's really important too for the student levels. Thank you all for those uh, responses. Let's take another one a di different area. 
The question is come from Francisco Ibanez Carrasco, and he said, what is your take on what workplace changes need to happen to include diverse non-tenured teachers in universities? We are now asked to work from our private spaces using our data plan, and it seems to be increasingly expected that we use lots of non-paid hours revisiting our courses, their activities, appeal, navigating, and evaluation. I could respond to that because we, we have a lot of adjuncts um, and I would say inclusion. Um, we constantly get from other departments as well asking us, how do you get them to do this to this or this? And we include them and treat them as part of the department because they really are and we can't function without them. Um, a lot of our adjuncts are subject matter experts. They have a lot of experience in the field because um, they're in it on a daily basis. So they come to our, we have department meetings regularly for them. Um, we recently had a costume party um, and they're very, very valuable members to our department. And we let them know that. And I think just that inclusion and having them participate regularly in all our events is, is so valuable. Um, they act as course leads and they have a voice. They're on our curriculum committee, they're on our research committees and letting them, letting them know their value and their voice is so important. Can I, can I add that I think we have to think about these same things for our full-time faculty and staff, clinical tenure, tenure track. Uh, um, the way we handled it at OSU was to allow people to come in and get their furniture from the office, their sit-stand desks, things that they need. But it's, it's, that was a, we imagined it as a one-time thing. I think we, we're going to have to imagine it differently going forward. Is this something that we need to think as institutions that we are giving people two spaces in which to work and helping them and giving them some financial support for those spaces. So Mark, I'm thinking about your, your comments about structural inequities. The, the space that we have to work with can have a big impact on how we interact with students in the, the classroom sitting all day, if that's not what we like to do, can have a big, big impact. And but I think and, and at the same time, I think we're gonna have to think about what does that mean for our physical spaces in our buildings. On the one hand, um, in my experience, people who don't show up to work don't get connected in the same ways. Uh, on the other hand, it's hard to imagine expanding expanding office spaces, expanding buildings, rather than thinking about how can we use our spaces in smarter ways? How can we begin to share spaces, do some hoteling? Um, but that's going to have that's going to have implications for community. So I think it's a I think it's a question for for adjuncts, for lecturers and for faculty who are who are who are with us um, full time. And if I may tag along, um just a little bit on Dean Fairchild's comment in regards to extending it to faculty and staff. One of the words that we're using increasingly is the word grace. And um, for faculty members to be able to be gracious, apply grace to students when they're saying, I couldn't make it, I was doing contact tracing, um, I just, um, could you let me have one more day? Um, but if we as administrators do not apply the same grace to faculty and have our faculty believe that we expect them to be acting like nothing's changed and everything's normal and that they have to be giving 100% of everything and, you know, putting in the same amount of grants and, and doing the same kind of, I mean, the same type of work, knowing that at the same time, um, their third grader is going to walk in and poke their head in and say, I really need to go to the bathroom. Can I use yours? It's happened to me. So we need to be able to apply grace in every environment we're in if we're ever going to get through this. And maybe this is a good opportunity to learn even that, that we are not valuable and worthy only because of what we can produce, but just because of who we are. And this is a good time to actually demonstrate that in our school. Thank you, Cynthia. Let me just get to the last question very, very quickly. It says, in our undergraduate programs, we have a robust value-driven curricular infrastructure, very deliberate curriculum design, and we have kept fidelity with high impact practices for years. All that said, there is increasing pressure to enroll more and more students to meet financial goals. Enormous online classes are attractive to financial managers for tuition revenue. 
Now COVID-19 trends in enrollment are dismal. I fear for the incentives, these incentives to provide quality education. So a few comments around that. So I can take a jump at that. Um, and, and that comes from the perspective of being at an institution, the University of Kentucky, that made a very firm commitment you know, uh, at midpoint of the summer that we were gonna offer what uh, our president calls a robust in-person college experience. And you know, we've done that in a way that has you know, safety protocols in place, that, that you know, there's a tremendous infrastructure behind it. But the argument for doing that was that our differentiator and our value as the University for Kentucky is in providing that robust, high quality in-person experience. And so I think one possible answer to the question is to really push back on some of the financial model of just adding bodies to seats and asking what distinguishes different kinds of educational experiences and what makes you know the, the, them valuable. In that you know the the, the analysis and you know partially it was a, you know a budgetary analysis right was was that the combination of safety, our mission, and, you know, how to deliver what we deliver um, in a sustainable way, what was to do it in person. So I think, you know, the sort of adding enrollments model absolutely is, it, it is there, but I think that there's some ways to argue for value financially in addition to educationally. The other thing that I think is true is, is, is that a lot of the high impact practices as they stand now really were written for brick and mortar in person experiences because of the time in which they were written. You know, we know from all the literature on digital education that it's not the modality that matters, it's the instructional design and the quality that matters, right? And, and you know, there's not a differentiator between a high quality in-person experience and a high quality online experience in terms of educational outcomes. The differentiator is how it's designed and how it's considered and how it's delivered. And so I think not so much thinking that we can't do high impact practices online, but that we need to think about how we transform those high impact practices if we are gonna do them in a digital environment is another answer. So there's two oppositional answers to the same question, <laughs> I realize as, as I've been talking. <laughs> Thank you, Mark. Just one minute reaction from, from someone else, if not, just to wrap up. Well, first of all, thank you very much. All the panelists have been just been great. I'm, I'm just so motivated. I know that we're gonna keep on these discussions. There's a lot to do, but I'm very optimistic that we can really transform the education and especially uh, the public health education. So thank you all for the great insights in this. Thank you for all the, the audience. Sorry that we couldn't answer all the questions because any, every single one of them have nearly <laughs> one or more time uh, just to discuss. But thank you all for being here. And now uh, I want to pass it to uh, Dean Galea to wrap up. Thank you, Dean. Well, um, first of all, thank you, Dr. Magania. And uh, thank you to all the speakers and all the panelists. I, um, I, I learn from you as I do every single time I listen to you. A couple of just concluding comments. Number one is I do want to echo what uh, Dr. Pennycook said about grace. It's a moment that uh, calls on all of us to, um, to find the grace in everything we do in uh, teaching is uh, is uh, central among there. And I, I just thought that was a very moving summary of, uh, of uh, a way forward, number one. Number two, I thought uh, Dr. Magania talking about optimism was really heartening. I actually thought that was uh, really wonderful. I actually also am filled with optimism. You know, there is no silver lining to a global pandemic. It's simply there isn't, but at least we can use this moment to learn. And I feel like when we have this kind of conversations, we're learning. And number three, I did want to bring it back to students. We are talking about teaching and teaching involves students, which is the next generation. And there was a comment in the chat from a student of uh, Dr. Sullivan's from 20 years ago, who said she appreciated the way that uh, you had engaged a large class then. And I think that is ultimately what is so rewarding about teaching, about everything we're doing, that we are training the next generation and that the next generation is going to do it better than we are doing it. Everybody, thank you for everything you're doing and thank you for teaching us today. Thank you to the panelists and thank you to the audience. Everybody, stay well, stay safe. Have a good afternoon. Thank you all.